أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من اللعين الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسل ربنا بالحق والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا لا سيما بقيه الله في الاراضين ارواحنا لتراب مقدمه الفداء ماي ديير لاز براذرز اند سيسترز السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته اوصيكم عباد الله واوصي نفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل والورع عن محارمه قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه المجيد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فاستقم كما امرت ومن تاب معك ولا تطغوا انه بصير بما تعملون ولا تركنوا الى الذين ظلموا فتمسكم النار وما لكم من دون الله من اولياء ثم لا تنصرون امنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Our discussion today will be guided by these two verses from Surah Hud, ayah number 112 and 113, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in extension, he tells us, to stay steadfast, to remain steadfast with those who have repented and not to transgress. For sure Allah is watching over your deeds. And in the second verse, he warns against leaning towards the oppressors. Don't be inclined in any way towards the oppressors. For sure Allah will not support you in that. You will not find guardians or helpers against Allah. These two verses need from us a deep reflection. Especially in these days that we commemorate the shahadat of Sayyidat Nisa'il Alameen, Fatima al-Zahara, salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. As we all know, in every year, in such days, we remind ourselves of the tragic event in the Islamic history that happened immediately after the death of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the injustices committed towards the household of the Prophet himself, and especially Fatima to Zahra. It is important for us, and this is my discussion with you, it is important for us to revisit those events, to study them and understand them. Why? Because they relate directly to the understanding of our own religion, to understanding the path of the truth. Some people would prefer that such events are forgotten or they are not mentioned. Are they are not brought into the limelight. 
Perhaps because some of, peop some of the people feel like discussing such events ignites tension among the Muslims and brings animosity and disunites the woman. And some people would prefer just to forget about them because of the bitterness of the event. However, we have a different view. This is not just a historical event. It is an event that touches on the core of the teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is related to the mission of the Prophet, to the mission of Islam. And it has an impact on understanding the truth of Islam. Means it's not a sectarian issue. It's not about Shia and Sunni. It is just about understanding Islam from the historical point of view. What happened? What happened that led us to be in this position today? Understanding the root causes of the events that unfolded days and months and years after the Prophet وسلم, is very crucial to understanding the truth of Islam. It's not possible to even understand why Karbala happened if we are not able to understand from the beginning what happened after the Prophet And when we talk of the atrocities committed towards the household of the Prophet وسلم, it's not just about <coughs> the things that were done wrongly at a personal level to the Ahlul Bayt but a transgression against the teachings that are laid down in the whole Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Turning a blind eye on those things is in a way accepting that in Islam, injustice can be condoned. Oppression can be accepted if it's done by certain people. We cannot escape when we discuss the events that happened after the Prophet وسلم, to mention certain names. And it's not with a bad intention. It's not meant to insult or to abuse anybody, but to state the fact, to understand the truth, so that we can be in the light, so that we can move in the straight path, so that we can relate to the truth and be part of the truth. And so we can be guided in, the, in our lives, in everything that we do. So let me just highlight very quickly on a few important facts that are mentioned in the history so we can reflect on them and so that we can learn about them. We know that immediately after the death of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu a group from the Muslims, the Ansar in particular, met in what was called as Saqifa Bani Sa'ida to discuss the future of Islam after the Prophet. Shortly they were joined by few Muhajirun, few, I mean less than 10, among the Muhajirun. There was a long debate between them, which ended with the selection of the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr bin Abi Quhafa. Now, this group that emerged with an, a Khalifa and announced a leader, a new leader to the Muslims, faced a challenge. The greatest challenge was how today face this reality that the Prophet ﷺ before his death had announced a leader. And that is Ali bin Abi Talib. There, there was need 
to secure allegiance, loyalty from Imam Ali al Islam, his household, and those who believed in that cause, in that path. And we know that in the early days, we mean less than a week after the death of the Prophet wasallam, there was an attempt to force certain people to accept this new leadership. And the truth of the matter, as recorded in the history, not as said by certain people, this culminated into an aggressive movement against the household of the Prophet. There was an attack on the house of Fatima sallallahu And this is a historical fact. It's not something which is fabricated. It's noted by the historians that there was an attack on this house. And there was an attempt to burn it. And that in that commotion, Fatima Zahra, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu was badly injured. And that resulted into her miscarriage of her baby, the inborn baby, called Mohsin. And the historians mention about Mohsin. This is, these are facts. These are not just things that are said by a certain group of people. These are historical facts. So certain things happened, for sure. And injustice was committed towards Fatima, in particular. Besides the, the issue of the Khilafat. These are historical facts. And when a person researches very quickly, for example, when, when you read in Milal wa Nihal of Ash-Shahrastani in the first volume, or Al-Masu'udi in his book about Wasiyya, Kitabatul Wasiyya, you'll find the mention of this. And many other historians have noted all these things. These are some th uh, things that cannot be doubted. The historical facts. In addition to that, historians note, and it's an accepted fact, that the Holy Prophet wasallam, by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as in Surah Al Ahzab, when this verse was revealed, give the near one his right. When this verse was revealed to the Prophet, the Prophet called Fatima sallallahu alayha and wrote for her the land of Fadak. The land of Fadak was surrendered to the Prophet without a fight. It belonged to him only. The Prophet gave it to Fatima. And from that time, before the death of the Prophet, this land was under the management of Fatima to Zahra. It was her own property. He had workers on that land. Therefore, there is also no doubt that there, there are properties which were given to Fatima to Zahra alayha, in the life of the Prophet. This was taken away, plus other things. On what claim? That the Prophet cannot be inherited. The hadith was fabricated for this reason. The Prophet cannot be inherited. Unfortunately, it's very sad that Muslims accepted this. Despite the fact that it contradicts directly, without any interpretation, the text of the Holy Quran, leave alone the Ahadith, where in Surah An Nisa, verse number seven, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Lirijal nasibun mimma tarak al walidani awil akrabun, walin Nisa nasibun mimma tarak al walidani awil akrabun, mimma qal aw kathur nasiban mafruda." For men, there is a share of what has been left by the two parents of the near ones. And for women, there is a share that has been left by the parents 
or the near ones. And this is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you go down to ayah number 11, the law of mirath is stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yusikum fi awladikum li dhakari mithul hadhil unthayayin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises you that there is a certain share that is supposed to be given to your children when you depart from this world. And it states, فَإِنْ كَانَ تُوَاحِدَةً فَنِصْفِ If it is one daughter, then half of what you leave belongs to her. And you see that this was the sunnah in this universe. The previous prophets who are inherited by their own sons. وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانِ دَاوُودِ Surat al-Naml, ayah number 16. And subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانِ دَاوُودِ So Sulaiman inherited Dawood. Yahya bin Zakaria. Or Zakaria prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a child. Ayah number 6 of Surah Maryam. وَإِنِّ خِفْتُ الْمَوَالِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي وَكَانَتِ مْرَأَةِ عَاقِرَةً فَهَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا يَرِثُنِي وَيَرِثْ مِنْ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ I fear about my relatives, about the what I'm going to leave behind, and my wife is old. So give me from you a child, waliyan, a guardian, that would inherit me and would inherit from the Ali Yaqub. This is a prayer of a prophet. To inherit what? Words, a hadith. This is called inheritance. This cannot be called inheritance. If it is the hadith, then everybody inherits. And he could have left everything to everyone to inherit because the prophets cannot be inherited. And this is what Fatima to Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa alayha brought out in her famous sermon called Fadakiya in the message of the Prophet sallallahu when he, she came flanked with, by women and she spoke a sermon that should be studied by all of us because in it it's not just about Fadak, about her inheritance it's about the ahkam of Islam, it's about aqaid it is about the akhlaq. You can see how she states from the beginning. The philosophy behind certain ahkam. The reason why we believe in certain things. Very important sermon. And then she mentions her right. She addresses the Khalifa. Is it right that in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will inherit your father and I cannot inherit my father? How do you judge? Where is this separation in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Fatima cannot inherit from her father and someone else can inherit his father? Where are the laws, how are the laws applied here? There was no response to this. There cannot, there can be, there cannot be any response to that because it contradicts the Quran al Karim. The stand of Fatima and the stance that she took against the rulers and against those who oppress her remains a guide for us. Because it draws a line between the truth and the false. It's not just about her own rights, it's about Islam. Because Fatima to Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not just an ordinary woman. Fatima to Zahra is a purified lady. She is ma'asuma by the Quran and by the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the Quran, ayah number 33 of Surah Al-Ahzab, no one doubts that she is the foremost member of this ayah. إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم رجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد. There is no one who doubts that Fatima was part of this house, 
that is purified. Both of these members are purified. So she is immune from sin. And this is one reason why you would be surprised why Fatima was supposed to present witnesses for her claim of Fadak, for example. Why should she be asked for that? For all Muslims who are reading these verses, knowing her status. From the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Fatima to Badu'atun minni. He did not say it in secret. He did not just say it to Fatima. He did not say it to few Muslims. It was commonly known and understood by Muslims. For the Prophet says, Fatima to me is part of me. Man adaha faqad adhani. Whoever annoys her, he annoys me. More than that, higher than this, it should suffice the, qawl, the word of the Prophet when he says, Yarda Allah li ridaha wa yaghdab li ghadabiha. Fatima is such a person that if she is pleased, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased. Not just that her, uh, you know, she is mutia, she is obedient to Allah, that her pleasure is in line, is in conformity with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if she is angry, and you should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry, those are the status of Fatima. Perhaps this is why you read also in the history <coughs> things that confirm the regret of people who oppress Fatima, but it couldn't change anything. As the historians read in his last days, the first Khalifa, one of the things that he regretted about, as is mentioned, why did he send people to the house of Fatima? And Fatima, alayhi salam, died angry on the people who oppressed her. These are historical facts that I believe we need to know and understand. And that we should be the people who stand with the truth, with justice. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is the lesson we need to take. وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ Do not be leaned towards those who have oppressed. لَا تَرْكَنُوا Rukun means a sukun. To be somehow inclined to be with the, with, with the oppressors. To accept, to support, even if it's indirectly, oppression. Let's you be touched by fire. Because the oppressors will not just burn, but they will burn those around them. The fire will extend to those who surround them. This is the act, but this is the fate. When you support and stand with the oppressors, with the injustice. In all cases, in all situations, in our lives, we should be opposed to injustice. We should be, not be part of the people who stand with the oppressors in whatever form. This is the guidance that we get from the stand of Fatima. Perhaps this is the lesson she wanted to leave for us when she made a wasiya that she should be buried at night in secret, and that people, certain people should not attend her funeral. Whenever you go to Medina, ask anyone to tell you where is the grave of Fatima. They will show you. They will not tell you. Maybe this is the reason why you also not be told where others are buried, because then you will ask where is Fatima's grave. Where is, where is the grave of Fatima? What happened to her? And these are the questions that one would ask. But the lesson that she leaves for us is to stand with the truth, to support the truth, to support justice, to be against oppression in any form, in any part of this world. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq, that we be among the true followers of Fatima to Zahra, 
صلوات الله وسلام عليها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين أوصيكم مجددا وأوصي نفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل Once again I remind all of you to be careful of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and to know that we are in the eyes of Allah whatever we do we are being watched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One should be ashamed of himself whenever he does something that means dislo disloyalty and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is going to be presented to every one of us. Whatever they will have done to be presented to them, to be present to them. The deeds are not lost. The records are not lost. So we should be careful of what are the records that we are going to face of our deeds. Besides this, and very quickly, since we are speaking about Fatima to Zahra, salatullah salamu alayha, besides her madhlumiya, there are bright lessons that we must take from her life. There are very important lessons that we must learn and put in practice. For her, she set for us very high standards that we must make an effort to reach. It's not easy. You see, when Ahl Bayt speak of generosity, for example, they don't just speak about being kind and being generous. They speak about something else. They speak of ithar. And they practice ithar, which is higher than generosity. And ithar is to deny yourself and prefer another over you. This is something which is so difficult, almost impossible. And some people would think it's not logical. If you are, given, uh, if you are in this situation, that you have something for yourself, and there is someone who also needs the same thing, would you prefer yourself? or you, do you give it to the other person who needs it. And people will argue that logically, you have to take care of yourself, and you have to take care of the immediate family members before you extend it to others. This is logical. But you see that Ahl Bayt have a different kind of practice. They have a different line completely. They will not look after themselves first. They look at others first. This is what Surat al-Dahr represents for us. Now, I cannot explain Surat al-Dahr and how they gave to the freed prisoner, to the orphan, to the miskin, to the poor, and accepted that they would not have anything after fasting. An example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights for us to think about, this is the Ahl Bayt. And one small line that we can reflect on, which solves many of our problems today, which can give peace to this world and create security, and help, help us overcome many challenges. It's a simple lesson that is given to us by the Lady of the Light, Fatima Zahra, salatu wa salam alayha. As reported in several different ahadith, one Hadith which is related through Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Uh, he was told by his brother Al Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam that that night, on the eve of Friday, I saw my mother in her mihrab praying all throughout. And in her prayers, she was praying for everybody. Mentioned the names of the people of Medina. Oh Allah give this and that 
help that person solve this problem for this one. Mention all the people of Medina. You know, in our practices, even in Du'ai, we are Bukhala. Okay, we mention our, ourselves first before the others. So Allah give me this and this and that. At the end, I may remember certain people and say, oh, Allah forgive so and so and help this and that. Imam Hassan alayhi salam relates that I had my mother praying for everyone in the, uh, among the people of Medina. And, and at the end, I asked my mother, oh, mother, you, I never had you praying for, for yourself. No, even for your children. So Fatima to Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi replies and says, Ya bunay al-jar thumma dar O my son, the neighbor first, then the house. Three words that gives us a guideline, a principle. That if we try to implement it, it's not very easy, of course. That you prefer another person before yourself. That you look after your neighbor before your house. If we implemented that, what would happen to this world? What kind of life would we have? Everybody takes care of the other. These are the teachings of Islam. These are the teachings of Ahl Bayt. This is Zahara Salawatullah. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq that we be able to move in those steps. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin abdika wa rasulik wa salli ala aliyin amir al-mu'mineen wa salli ala Fatima al-Zahara sayyidati nisa ila alameen wa salli ala al-Hasani wa al-Husayn sayyidayi shabab ahl jannat min al-khalqi ajma'in wa salli ala a'immat al-muslimin min dhuriyyat al-Husayn Ali ibn al-Husayn zayn al-Abidin wa Muhammad ibn Ali al-Baqir wa Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq wa Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadim wa Ali ibn Musa موسى الرضا ومحمد بن علي الجواد وعلي بن محمد الهادي والحسن بن علي الزكي العسكري والخلف الهادي المهدي حججك على عبادك أمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائمة اللهم اغفر لنا والجميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك سميع مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد